Love is in the air. All over the world, people celebrate the day of marriage. When two lovers begin, they're happily ever after. Zach and I are engaged! <laughs> Flowers, food, family. On the surface, this special day may look like a fairy tale, but what price would you pay for the perfect day? Now, according to Wedding Report Incorporated, the average American wedding costs over $25,000. We're going behind the scenes of the wedding industry to find out how this day of celebration became so commercial. The dress, the ceremony, the cake, it all symbolizes true love. Nope, those traditions represent one thing, money. We'll talk to the professionals that left the wedding business that are finally ready to share the stories they never told. I had a business, but that, that kind of stopped when I had a stroke. I mean, we have to admit, there's a lot of pressure for the ring to be big. They think that that means that their fiance loves them more. It's a status symbol. Is there a right way to plan your big day? Or will this industry of love break your heart and your bank? They're going to help me with my phone bill this month, and that person is going to help me with my rent. Pointing yeah. at customers? Yeah. As I begin planning my own wedding, I'm determined to find out the truth. Thank you to ThreadUp for sponsoring this video. Have you ever wished you could go thrift shopping online? Say I do to ThreadUp. ThreadUp is an online consignment and thrift store for your closet, your wallet, and the planet. Shopping on ThreadUp for me is like finding hidden gems. When I'm thrifting, I get so excited when I find a high quality garment for such a great discount. My favorite way to use ThreadUp is by searching the brands I already love. My first look is this Zara top with this skirt from H&M. Look number two is another top from Zara, paired with these Calvin Klein slacks. You might remember these from my last thread up video. I love how these two pieces ended up working together. And to top it all off, this leather shoulder bag that I got from thread up. The original retail on this bag was $60 and I got it for $27.99. I love it because I was looking for a Bottega inspired bag and this one is a perfect replica. And last but not least, outfit number three. Surprise, surprise, another top from Zara with the H&M skirt. I love how all of these outfits are giving me romantic Paris vibes. But you guys, the best find of all. For months, I've been looking for a pair of these gray sweater Uggs. They are $200 retail and I did not want to spend that. So imagine my surprise when I found them on ThreadUp in my size. And guess how much I got them for? $75.99, which is more than half off. I'm genuinely so happy I was able to find them for that price after months of searching. So if you guys want to start thrifting today, click my link in the description. Use my code Natalia and save up to 60% off on your first thread of order, plus free shipping and find pieces that you'll fall in love with forever. Thank you so much again to ThreadUp for partnering with us on this video. Now let's get back to it. <laughs> One 
Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, a beautiful young woman dreams of her big day. It's been years in the making, a wish finally coming true. But in real life, there's no fairy godmother or bippity bobbity boo. So unless Prince Charming can refinance his castle and Cinderella pawn off her shoe, planning that royal wedding is going to be a hassle, and you might go in debt to say I do. We all know how the fairy tales go, and growing up with Disney films definitely gave me some unrealistic expectations. About love and life. But deep down, I believe that some of us still want to fulfill that childlike dream. And what better day to fulfill that fantasy than your wedding day? I know what you're thinking. This is all a dream that I'm about to wake up from. Well, you're wrong. My fiance and I got engaged in May of 2021. And like most couples, we have no idea how to plan a wedding. I've heard the wedding planning process can quickly become overwhelming. So that's why I decided to start with something a little more fun. So I'm headed to Winnie Couture in Beverly Hills to try on a few wedding gowns. I told Nicole that the appointment was at 3 o'clock, but it was really at 3.30. I made it at Yeah. I like it better without that fabric yeah. on it. 
insane. And then like with gloves. It does look more elegant. Yeah. yeah. Like imagine like a glove. Do you have a shawl? Love. I love the love. shawl with it. Like that makes it just like yeah. so much more my style. So much more like elegant. Very sleek. Sleek. So just like a little bit longer with transits, like more dramatic. Yes, actually, like I love the dress a lot more with something like. Yeah. I have to admit, trying on these dresses at Winnie Couture made me feel like a real life princess. As I was trying on each and every gown, I felt like I was there for the experience. Every single detail was absolutely perfect and I couldn't believe how kind and helpful the dress specialists were. I really got the impression that they actually cared, which was such a contrast to the stressful, overwhelming wedding planning experience I've heard so much about. Beautiful with all of you here. They're gonna be probably the most beautiful bride I'll ever see. I was really starting to envision what my wedding day was going to look like. And now that I have my dress, I want to go back to the beginning when the idea of engagement is at its conception. without first getting engaged. And most of the time, it involves a ring. Finding the perfect engagement ring just might be one of the most important steps. With such a big investment, is there a way to know you're getting what you pay for? And how can you trust those sketchy jewelry salesmen standing behind the counter working on commission. It's easy to feel the pressure, but I want to know the truth. So we're talking to Jason, an ex jewelry salesman who used to specialize in selling engagement rings. He's ready to share with us all of the secrets that the jewelry companies don't want you to know. Hello, Jason. Hello, Natalia. So you are an ex jeweler. I am. How many dollars would you say you've sold in jewelry? Oh my goodness. Uh, probably well over five million dollars. Five million dollars? Obviously I, I sold all different types of jewelry um, from Rolex watches to Cartier watches and jewelry, Patek Philippe watches, but my favorite part was the engagement ring process and working with couples, working with young men, older men, um, finding the right stone for them to present to someone that they love. What is that process like? Uh, you know, it's an interesting um, process. I mean, because as a jewelry salesperson, we are a destination. So when somebody walks in the door, you know, the owner will say they walked in for a reason, even if they say, I'm just looking. Why is that? <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of a lot of pressure. Like I know I've done that. I've walked into a exactly. jewelry store and I've been no. approached and I'm like, I don't want this guy to sell me something that I can't afford. People walk in with walls up because it is a sales experience and they don't want to get a sales job. They want a, to meet a person. We've all experienced it. When you walk into a store and feel the pressure to buy. Personally, I've always preferred an independent shopping experience and I can't help but feel like most people are also uncomfortable when a salesperson is hovering over you. 
I've worked in retail myself, so I understand a lot of the pressure comes from the company on their employees, but no one wants to feel like they're being sold something they can't afford. In a jewelry store, like, everything is so expensive. I had items for $25. I could sell in that jewelry store. I had items for over a million. What can you buy in a jewelry store for $25? Well, there's pendants, there's... Charms, a tie clip? Chimes, charms for bracelets, <laughs> yeah. There's tie clips, there's, you know, cufflinks. The Sterling Silver telephone dialer at six seventy-five, including tax. Sterling Silver telephone dialer? Yes, sir. at six seventy-five, including federal tax. Well, the price is right, but uh, I must say I'd rather hope for something slightly more, how shall I say it, uh, romantic in feeling. You know, different silver cufflinks, um, you know, there's engraved pens. It reminds me of that scene in Breakfast at Tiffany's. So they go into the Tiffany's store and there's all these expensive diamonds right. and Holly Golightly, the main character, absolutely broke, but <laughs> doesn't know how to tell the salesperson right, that she's yeah, broke yeah. and says, well, I don't care for diamonds. I think they're tacky. What do you think? Well... Of course, personally, I think it'd be tacky to wear diamonds before I'm 40. But that's what it reminds me of, is yeah. people are drawn to the luxury of jewelry, but sometimes there's not a, an awareness on right. what, you know, how, what budgets you guys can cater to. The assumption that I can't afford anything from a fine jewelry store has always kept me from walking in the front door. So I can imagine when shopping for an engagement ring, taking that leap of faith can be pretty intimidating. So let's say someone wants to buy an engagement ring. They walk in the door. How would you take them through that process? For me, it's always about building that relationship first, introducing myself, getting to know the person's name. And then from there, just asking questions, you know, have you been looking for long? What are you looking for? And then kind of narrowing it down to uh, different engagement ring styles. I mean, there's a case that is just engagement rings. And when a customer finds himself in front of that case and they're looking in that case, they're giving you these nonverbal cues like, okay, this is what I'm looking for. I've looked at that case. <laughs> I know that case. Yes, yeah, there's a case in every jewelry store, or multiple <laughs> cases, but where it's just engagement rings. The thing that really bugged me was this preoccupation with the size of the diamond or the gemstone. That size mattered more than anything else, more than the quality of the actual stone itself. And so I feel like, as a professional, I ended up educating most of my customers about the quality of the stone versus the size of the stone. And it gave me an opportunity as a teacher to teach about gemstones and the four C's of diamonds, right? Cut, color, clarity, and carat size. These are the four most important aspects to a diamond. Color, cut, clarity, and carat weight. No matter where you are purchasing your diamond from, these characteristics should all be discussed. I mean, we have to admit, there's a lot of pressure for the ring to be big. For some reason, we as humans think bigger is better, right? Some people do, and a lot of people do. And, they, and for that, it's a, it's a competition and a comparison, especially if a, a young woman or an older woman, doesn't matter, they have a friend who has a big diamond, right? and they think that that means that their fiance loves them more or whatever, it's a status symbol. It's no secret that we live in a culture of comparison. For many, the size of your engagement ring or diamond communicates wealth and status, the way we do with many other things, like the size of your home or if you drive a luxury vehicle. Don't get me wrong, all of those things are great, but if we spend too much time focusing on comparison over quality, we might be missing out. The quality of the cut of the diamond will actually turn this diamond from a, you know, just a simple piece of glass, it looks like. If it's not cut right, it looks like a piece of glass. When it's cut perfectly, when it's cut really well, the light that goes into the stone is all refracted back out through the top and it literally looks like it is plugged into the wall. And it looks bigger probably. It looks it, bigger. When it's yes. cut 
correctly. Exactly. And that's the thing. So many different people were focusing on getting a large diamond. They were not worried about the color or the clarity or even the cut. Cut, we believe, is the most important of the four C's. I'm sure that you've heard about round cut, princess cut, emerald cut, and so on. But square cut or pear shape, these rocks don't lose their shape. But when we talk about the four C's, we're not referring to the shape, but the quality of the cut. An excellent cut is what will help the stone sparkle and shine the most. You know, you can get a poorly cut, you know, two or three carat diamond, and it's just a big rock on your finger, and it and it looks awful, it looks fake. And I, I know it sounds silly, but growing up, I always assumed that diamonds came out of the ground looking cut. <laughs> do a lot of people think that? I think people do. In the rough means it's not cut, it's not polished. There's a lot of cutting and polishing and fine tuning to do that, just like it is in our lives, right? In our marriage. In our marriage. Only one may enter here, the diamond in the rough. So what was your favorite thing about selling engagement rings? I would have to say getting to know the people that you're working with. There was a lot of pressure to make the sale. Um, there was pressure by management and by owner. When I was in management, there was pressure by the owner that when a client walked out the door or a customer walked out the door, you've lost them. But it takes a while to build a relationship. So my favorite thing was building that relationship and then they would come back and we would have another conversation and then you build more relationship. There was this um, client who would drive in from Los Angeles, not every weekend, but I, once or twice a month. You know, he, he brought his girlfriend in and they just wanted to see the new stuff that we had. And I would take them on a tour of the store. And they were this young couple from LA. And every once in a while, he would buy her a, you know, a little something. And you know, it was a couple hundred dollars. It was nothing huge, nothing big. What are we going to do? I thought you were going to help us get married. And so I developed this relationship with them. I even had them over for dinner at our house one time. It came time, he said, you know, I'm, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to ask her. I guess you might say, we're engaged to be engaged. And I felt, get emotional, I felt like I was a large part of their, of their process. And it was, it was really special. And so he would come by himself sometimes and we would look at different diamonds. And we looked at probably close to 20 different diamonds before he said, all right, that's the one. It sounds like you create a relationship with the customers that you served that wasn't a sales relationship. No, not in engagements, no. In other type of jewelry, sure. You know, if somebody's coming in to buy a Rolex watch, that was more transactional. The engagement ring process was a relationship. Now you mentioned that in the corporate world, they would tell you, if the customer walks out the door, you've lost them. Exactly. All because you didn't take that super salesy approach. Right. You formed relationships with these people as if they were your friends. You understood how intimate this process actually is. Exactly. Did you ever run into any corporate conflict with this type of approach? Of course, all the time, yeah. Because in my opinion, this is how every jewelry salesman should look at the process. <laughs> I mean- I agree. You agree? Oh yeah. But I had, I had coworkers who, there was one specific coworker, and when he shared this story with me, it just made me feel gross all over. <laughs> he said, that person, you know, they're going to help me with my phone bill this month, and that person is gonna help me with my rent, and that person is gonna pay my 
my car. Pointing that, at customers? He was pointing figuratively because he was trying to teach me how to sell when I first started at this store. This story absolutely shocked me. I knew there were shady salespeople in the world, but pointing at customers and simply reducing them to a dollar sign is one of the most disturbing things I've ever heard. This is why I always avoid the sales counter. I understand people need to make a living, but if a jewelry store is establishing a culture of competition and commission, these types of stories are bound to happen when the focus is solely on the sale. And he was sharing this almost animalistic uh, survival instinct of, I have to make this sale, otherwise I won't be able to pay the bills type of mentality. When I heard that, I kind of, you know, went inside, I was like, I never want to be that person. I never want to be that person. And so what I did was, I was getting paid hourly at the time. I made sure that my lifestyle, I was able to live within the lifestyle of my hourly wage. And anything I made on commission was just extra. And so for me, it wasn't about making the sale all the time. And it was interesting because I was the least greedy person in the store that I worked at as far as sales and commissions, but I sold more than everybody else. It makes total sense why Jason did so well, how he sold more jewelry than anyone in his district. I mean, I would much rather buy from a salesman that let me make my own decisions rather than putting the pressure on. This establishes a culture of trust, creating a genuine environment where you can get to know one another and learn what it means to invest in such a sentimental piece of jewelry. But one thing Jason said that really stuck with me was his self-awareness with finances. The way Jason describes setting a boundary with his income, not allowing himself to rely on potential commissions prevented him from getting too greedy and looking at people like ATMs. This is what sets people like Jason apart in the engagement ring industry. Because of the relationships right. that you would build and you wouldn't look at your friends or your clients as no. dollar signs. No. I think a lot of people, when they enter into a jewelry store, they can pick up on that energy. Yep. Thank you to ThreadUp for sponsoring this video. Tune in next week for part two.